Christmas dinners, I'd go have the Christmas dinner with the physicians, but the custodial crew would say, Dr. Bill, come eat with us too. And I'd always have something special that I took with me. I'm a maker, I like to do stuff, I like to build stuff. When I bump into a problem, I figure out what it's gonna take to make it work, and I try to get it to happen. We're gonna do something a little different today. Most of the time speakers don't want you to pull out your phone. Pull out your phone. We're gonna play a game. This is a harder trick. And if you will, hit your browser and type in these words. Chinese, put a space. Scales, put a space. Experience, and then hit your go button or whatever button you've got on your browser. What's the first hit that comes up? Schumach.com. Yeah, Schumatech. Open that PDF. And did anybody notice how many hits there were when you typed in Shiny Scales Experience? So if you open that little PDF and scroll down to the bottom, whose name do you find there? That's a parlor trick. That's <laughs> <laughs> Back in 2004, my son was in Iraq, and I had hooked up, this is back in the earlier days of the internet, I had hooked up on a Yahoo group with a bunch of guys who were building a digital readout. Now a digital readout is something that you use in milling, machining, all kinds of things when it is that you want to keep track of where a cutter head is or where a piece of material is. And you want to do it in thousandths of an inch, uh, ten thousandths of an inch and such as that. At the time, in 2004, you couldn't find digital readouts that wouldn't cost you more than a thousand dollars. So a bunch of fellows decided, well, where pretty bright, we can figure out how to build our own. Well, one of the problems with the, uh, with these digital readouts is you've got to have some kind of a scale that travels along either with the cutting head or the, the slide that carries the material. Some, something's got to keep track of position. And that was the biggest bugaboo in all of this, was what was it used to keep track of position? And lo and behold, it was shiny scales. This is a photo that you'll find in that PDF. The reason why that PDF comes up pretty quick, Ron will tell you, is because of the words that I had you type in. But part of it is this has been linked to thousands of times by people who are hobby machinists wanting to know how to set up the scales on their lathe or mill or their table saw or whatever. The scales are these little stainless steel beams that you see. You see the little black encoders. We figured out a way to tap the data out of that black encoder, or encoder and pull it up to the readout you saw a minute ago we developed machines then that allowed us as hobbyists to measure down to a thousandths of an inch. Later, I took it down to five ten thousandths of an inch by importing scales from Korea. Glass uh, scales as opposed to the stainless steel scales. So I'm a maker. This was my first big involvement in the internet, my first big involvement in a group on the internet. We never met each other, ever. And we were able to pull together this uh, digital readout. They are, the digital readouts are all around the world now. We had members of our group in Sweden, Thailand, Russia, all around the world, and they would build these digital readouts. Uh, and they would work, hobbyists, figuring out how to do something. There's more to this story. We'll get to that in just a minute. Um, I'm going to fill in the painful part. Bob came back from Iraq. Bob was injured. 
he had uh, multiple concussions, he had post-traumatic stress disorder, the VA wasn't ready to get their act together. They hadn't set up the VA to do what needed to be done for those soldiers, so some of my physician friends and I had to put Bob back together. Here's the other painful part of this. At about the same time, I had a cataract developing in my right eye. I lost my left eye in 1978 uh, from a surgical complication. Cataract developing in my right eye. I wasn't able to read anymore. Couldn't function as a neuropsychologist. In 2005, I said, Judy, I can't do this anymore. She went to Lowe's, got a for sale sign, put it out in front of the house. And five days later, we'd sold the house, and we were coming back to Texas, where so much of my family lives. Um, this business with the Chinese scales, like I say, was my first exploration into the internet, how to use the internet and such as that. We came back to Texas because I was losing my vision, and it was many, many years later before they'd take the cataract out of my eye. Um, Oh, I hate saying this part of it. I stopped driving in 2006. That's when I retired my Texas license because I couldn't see anymore. Judy had to drive me around. I wasn't safe to cross a street by 2009. Couldn't see to cross a street by myself. Finally in 2009, since I had nothing to lose, they took the cataract out. And lo and behold, I started coming back. Mike mentioned that I was at Best Buy for years. I was just either in my office or in my shop. I would not go out in the public. After Bob came home, that just wore me out putting him back together. I went blind, that wore me out more. I just didn't need to be out in the public. The reason why I took the job at Best Buy was to see if I could do it again. And sure enough, I did as a part-timer. By the way, I left Best Buy Saturday. Oh, uh, so now I'm back to being me. So <laughs> all of these things kind of fall together. You're hearing the story. Um, parts of this I didn't want to tell, and, and we got through that. Okay, grab your phone. <clears throat> Going to do another parlor trick. Go to your browser and type in Honda Valkyrie Fairing. Now one of us who likes to ride a Valkyrie, so he told me a minute ago, will really enjoy this part and look for videos. If you find a link of videos, the first video you see will be of this funny looking thing that somebody's put together and you'll see it's Haven's Designs that published the video. That's the other parlor trick. That's one of mine that's up on the uh, internet right now. The Honda Valkyrie is a motorcycle after they did my eye surgery several years later, I told Judy, I want to ride a motorcycle again. <laughs> and so I bought a, a Motor Guzzi. I'd always ridden Motor Guzzi's. I've gone to a Valkyrie for a very specific reason. What you'll see in that video are the early parts of me building this design for this fairing. This particular model is not supported by Honda. There's no fairing, no windshield for it. Um, I don't know why they did that, but they did. Um, so I developed this design that clears the cowlings, the radiated cowlings on the side. This is the buck. That's what they call the positive you make, that you make a mold from. It's called a buck. Believe it or not, this is made out of blue board, insulation board that they put on the sides of houses, laminated up to get the shades. Easy work, not so easy to deal with at times. Here it is with the fiberglass being laid on it to create the mold. The black is a type of epoxy material that I put on the buck before I started laying up the fiberglass. Hmm. Here's the fairing popped out of the mold. Uh, the one closest to us is the real fairing. The mold is that one on the other side. Here it is having been painted and now there it is on the school. Ooh. So as I said, I'm one of these guys that if they don't make it, I'm going to figure out how to make it happen. I enjoy doing that kind of stuff, and that's who I am. But our big question is, what about the box? The title of this was, what do you do if your idea is too far out of the box? 
but I'll explain that. As I said, um, in that period that I was losing my vision, before I got to the point where I had to stop driving, Judy and I had moved back to Texas, and we said, what are we going to do? Well, Hurricane Katrina came through New Orleans. Rita blew through uh, the Port Arthur area. And I said, hey, let's go help them clean up with Rita. That's something we can do. We'll be constructive. So we went down there, lived in a tent for three weeks. And I said, Judy, and she said, I don't like sleeping on the ground either. <laughs> let's go buy an old RV. So we found an old RV, and the guy agreed to take $1,000 off the price because the generator wouldn't work. And what was wrong with the generator? The coil, <laughs> that's all it was. Replaced the coil, the generator worked, everything was fine. So we went on down, headed down to Beaumont, where we were stationed. And as I was driving, I said, Judy, can you read these gauges? When she got in the driver's seat about an hour later, she said, nope, can't read them at all. And of course, you can imagine what went off in my head. How do I fix this problem? <laughs> this ain't right. Somebody ought to fix it. Now, I'm a neuropsychologist, so I've dealt all the time with people who, for one reason or another, can't. And how we know that people do things, how they interact with their environment, is by watching makes it what makes it difficult yes. for people who can't interact yes. to see where the problem comes up. Yes. So I immediately started to analyze this, and when we finally got back up here from Beaumont, I decided that I was going to build an information display for vehicles based on human factors. Yes. That's how humans interact with the environment and cognition. That's how humans uh, think or deal with their thoughts and behaviors and the like. What I'd like you to do is take your phone. Uh, I've got my iPhone. Ron likes iPhones. Ron, Ron doesn't like Android, do you? No, nope. nope, he doesn't like Android. I'm sorry. I'll hold up my iPhone. Okay. If you look at yours, if you've got an Android, if it's a Samsung, you've got the TouchWiz uh, user interface. This is Apple's user interface. What's wrong with this? Anybody have any ideas? Nothing. Everything <laughs> is wrong with this. From a human factors perspective, everything is wrong with this. This is an array. And when humans look at an array, the first thing they do is they go to the center when they're looking for information. Why do we go to the center? Well, that's how we get our bearings, and that's how we know where things are. If we don't find the information that we want in the center, we next go to the top left corner. So on my phone, it would be up here. If we don't find it there, we go over to the top right corner. If we don't find it there, we go to the bottom right corner, and then guess what we do? We go back to the center. We ignore the bottom left corner. This has been shown time and time again to be the case, no matter where you come from. Uh, if you speak Hebrew, read Hebrew, you read right to left. Still, they do the same thing. In the US, we speak, well, we read English, most of us do. Um, we read left to right, the way we do it, center, top left, top right, bottom right, back to the center. That's called scanning an array. At about the same time I began to explore this, this thing came on the market. When did the iPhone hit the market wrong? Do you remember? Yeah, I do not. Yeah. Yeah. About the same time I was exploring this, this came on the market. Suddenly we had a computer display in our hands, and what was happening with drivers? <laughs> they became distracted. So this business of the distracted driver became a big, big deal. The University of Virginia does most of the research on distracted drivers, and what they found was that if drivers had their eyes off the road for more than one and a half seconds, that was an event. Accidents happen 
when events occur. So if your eyes are off the road for one and a half seconds, you're more likely to have an accident than if your eyes are off the road a shorter amount of time. Well, if you want an operator's eyes to stay on the road, if you want a pilot's eyes to stay in the air, then what you want to do is make sure they can find the information as quickly as possible so they can get it in their head, process it, and then get their eyes back on the road or on the air. Well, then you organize it according to how we scan arrays. Another problem with this, these little icons, some of them have text in it. If you want to process rapidly, you go analog first, digital second, and throwaway text. Text takes too long to process if you want rapid processing. Just dispatch it, get rid of it. These are terms or research that's been done for years and years and years in cognitive neuroscience. It was well known. So, being the fellow that I am, <laughs> remember I'm in my shop. I'm almost blind. I'm using large magnifiers and I'm using uh, giant uh, computer displays trying to get this stuff done. I'm working very, very slowly and methodically because I can't see. I came up with A. This is A. After I designed my first uh, vehicle information display, I said to Judy, you know what? I'm a scientist. We're going to go find out if this really does what I say that it does. We're going to find out if people really like this. So we're going to do basic research. So I developed A. One fellow who saw this said, well, where did you have that molded? <laughs> Guess what? <laughs> That's MDF. Judy painted it with a multi-layer paint job, and it looked just like um, it was molded vinyl, the top part of it. The display on Eddie was one of my earlier designs, and it was pretty crude. But if you, well, there's a number of things here. If you notice, speed, when you're going down the highway, speed's number one, needs to be in the center. Top left is going to be gas if you're driving an RV, and that's where we took this to display it and see what people thought of it. Gas is your second biggest issue in an RV if it's gas powered. If it's diesel powered, eh, diesel is still your second biggest issue. <laughs> <laughs> Next one's voltage. Wiring on RVs go out all the time. You want to make sure you've got voltage, and then the next one is your coolant temperature and all that stuff. So I threw this thing together, and I said, okay, let's go test it. <laughs> so we went to, well, first, blind, working with a patent attorney, filed a patent application, and then I said, okay, now we can go test it. Forgot that step. Patent application filed in 2008 on this business of cognitive mapping. That's what this is called, positioning things where people will see them in the order that you expect them to look for them. Cognitive mapping. So then we went to a Family Motor Coach Association meeting. Judy drove us all the way over to North Little Rock, Arkansas. We took Eddie. We took the other things that we put in our booth. I put together some questionnaires that were science-based. And each day that we ran our little booth, uh, people had the opportunity to get a $50 gift card if they filled in a survey for us. In three days, we got 101 surveys done. So the power of our survey, and you guys who know stat, the power of our survey was okay. It wasn't bad at all. There were an estimated 1,100 independent RVs at that uh, show. I mean, these were just Family Motor Coach Association people, some really fun people. The study conducted at a booth in the rally. I rented a booth. I mean, come on, if you want to know if people are going to like it, uh, find out. Rent a booth, find out. Get your data done before you blow any more money on it. <laughs> the results of the study were shocking. 101 family responded, 86 men, 15 women. All were active owners, operators of motor homes. 
71 acknowledged that they had difficulty reading their gauges. That's a chi square of 16.644. The possibility that this is inaccurate is five in a hundred thousand. That's accurate. They had difficulty reading their gauges. 76 would buy that display if I had it available. And they, uh, well, 76 would put it in their present motor home, retrofit. Remember that little term, retrofit. That's, gosh, you can't even calculate uh, how crazy significant that is. 0.00001. 96 would want it in a new motor home if it was available. Well, you can't even calculate a chi-square when the data are so positively skewed. Statistics are meaningless then because you're almost at 100%. So it looks like in that research we did that we found out this is a neat deal. And then guess what happened? Anybody remember? Here's what happened. The economy crashed. The motorhome business died. I talked to a fella at Cummins Diesel. They make a lot of the diesels for RVs and motorhomes. About a year into the crash, and he said, Bill, I've sold one new diesel engine in the last six months to the motorhome industry. One. It had died. Well, I had my data. My data said people like this, a lot of them will do it as a retrofit. How do I make this work if I really want to go with it? But then I realized there is this issue. Retrofit molds are expensive. You saw the mold I fabricated for that fairing. If I had to do that for every RV that was out there on the road, it would have killed me economically. Couldn't be done it would have been a poor choice. So what I did was to put it on hold for a while. The patent came through in 2011. In 2011, I decided, okay, now I really ought to do something with this. Once the patent was awarded, I went over to the library in downtown Abilene and pounded out a paper. And I sent it up to the uh, Society of Automotive Engineers. Grab your phone, put this into your search browser, or your browser. See what pops up. And what you'll see is up comes this reference to that paper that the Society of Automotive Engineers published. They published the paper and then asked me to present <coughs> at a heavy vehicle conference or congress in Chicago. So off we went. Uh, what you pick up there, your first hit will just be the reference to the paper from the Society of Automotive Engineers. Another part of trick. This is the title page from the, the presentation that I did at the Society of Automotive Engineers um, in 2011. And the title, it's one of those goofball scientific titles. Everybody loves those things. <coughs> why, why did I present? Increase the awareness of the benefits of applying human factors in cognitive neuroscience. You guys already know. We know there's a benefit to it. We told them these are our objectives. Describe human factors and cognitive issues. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The cognitive issues in dashboard displays First is that organization. Second is what's called <coughs> figure ground. Figure ground is being able to discern the figure from the background. So if you've got a red needle on a mahogany veneer, you'll never see it. Figure ground gets in the way there. There's other things like contrast discrimination and on and on and on the, the scientific words go. So I wanted to remind them of all those things and then summarize the benefits of applying human factors and cognitive neuroscience principles to dashboard displays. I gave them a bunch of stats. This is what we saw a minute ago about the fact that the people in the study said they couldn't read their gauges. Um, 
Is it an age kind of a thing? Well, my age range was too small. These are people driving RVs, so they typically are 50 and up. My age range was too small to really see any age-related effect. Female versus male, nope. Not any real difference there. Um, gauge reading difficulty compared to power plant. Nope, diesels are as bad as uh, gas-driven motor homes. Difficulty compared to retrofit purchase. Here's the reason I put that in there. This retrofit purchase is, is it an older design versus a newer design? So if they've got a new motor home, they probably won't want to put it in there. If they've got an old motor home, yeah, they'd like to have it. I'm trying to discriminate between newer motor home and older motor home. And sure enough, yeah, if they don't see well, they'd love to have it. And then this one is compared to new vehicle purchase. Uh, yeah, the difficulty wasn't related there. So anyway, I gave them all the old uh, stuff here. Went through the paper, had a few questions, heard some people say you didn't tell us anything new, I was fine with that, why haven't you been doing it if you already knew it? And then one of the engineers, Daimler, sponsored the event, said, Bill, would you please go down and go through our static display and tell us what we need to do differently? So I was eight years younger, my wife was eight years younger, and there was this little Brazilian woman who had presented in the group with me, uh, three talks presented in the same session. She's wearing stiletto heels and she said, I'll go with you. Oh boy, so we're climbing in and out of Peterbilt. <laughs> She's wearing stiletto heels. My wife is as white-headed as I am. And these young men who work for Peterbilt are about to die because they just know we're going to fall out of the cab or one of those <laughs> and they're going to be liable for it. As I was crawling out of one of their big vehicles, one that's got a sleeper and all that stuff, I bumped into this big German man and said hello and he said, what is your name? And I said, well, I'm Bill Havens. Oh, I read your paper. Oh, well, thank you for doing that. I'm the head of human factors for Daimler. And I thought, oh my goodness. And we visited for a while, and the bottom line of my discussion with him was the way we do dashboard displays is this. When you have a quarter million displays sitting in your warehouse, we allow you to bid our contract. A quarter million displays sitting in your warehouse, then we will allow you to bid. Well, I came home <laughs> and I thought, nope, I'm too old to try to raise that kind of money. I'm just not going to do it. Which brings us back to the Valkyrie. What do you do when you've got a pretty good idea? Some people have said, this is neat, let's do something with it. What do you do? You keep scrambling. I bought this Valkyrie after we returned home. My old Moto Guzzi, the wiring on it, uh, it was all individual sensors, not modern wiring. This Valkyrie has modern wiring. I hoped it had a CAN bus on it. A CAN bus is a kind of a network that they use in vehicles that allow different sensors to talk to the ECU, the computer in the vehicle. And if you want to look at speed, oil pressure, such as that, you simply listen on the CAN bus to the data coming out of the ECU. And if you know what the code is, and you pay $75 for that book, if you know what the code is, then you can pick up how fast you're going. Well, that's one way to do it. It turns out this bike doesn't have it set up that way. But this is where the project is gone. This is, um, you'll quickly see, speed's in the middle of this. This is an early, early, early LCD prototype, and I wanted you to see this. Now remember I said that people look at the middle when they want information, and if you want to make them see information, you make sure it shows up in the middle. 
Have you ever followed a motorcycle and they left their turn signal on and you don't know if they're going to turn or not and you're afraid you're going to hit them? Why? Well, if we did it traditionally, what would happen is the uh, turn signal would stay on and they wouldn't know it. But in this little LCD that I programmed, I decided I was going to have the turn signal occupy the middle and flash through the speed. So this is that human factors thing coming back, cognition coming back. I can't show you the latest version of this stuff because I'm just not ready to let anybody see it. But that was an early uh, example of some programming I did. Why use this bike? Here is this one connector. Everything comes to that connector. I brought that connector with me, I didn't pull it out of the bag. So all I have to do is to plug in this little circuit board I designed, and now I can tap every signal on that motorcycle that I want to see. Where we're going with the project now, I'm sorry, Ron, it's Android. <laughs> we're building a black box. That's probably the best way. And the simple little black box will allow me, well, it will sit right there, occupy less space than the present gas gauge. It will allow me to plug in an Android device. As soon as it plugs in, the Android device will recognize the black box, pull up our uh, gauge cluster. It will be charged through the USB port, and boom, we'll have human factors on a motorcycle. But the beauty of the Android device is different. Nowadays, they make Android devices that are what's called IP67, IP68 rated. That means they're water and dust resistant. Oh, they can be out on the motorcycle. They get caught in a rainstorm and it won't hurt them. I can go this size. This is a little Nokia phone that uses Android 1, the stripped down version of Android. I can go this size. This is one of the Samsung tablets with super AMOLEDs in it, daylight visible. That's another thing that had me stalled. The science hadn't made a daylight visible display. They finally have one that's almost 80% daylight visible. Would you agree with that? Uh, but anyway, the, the whole idea is you can make a display, bring the display you want to, put it on the handlebars of the bike. There's no retrofitting, no molds, all that stuff. Mounts up there and boom, off you go. Another beauty of this system, we think, is as our gauge cluster shows, down here in the bottom left corner will be a little widget. And the widget will be Google Maps. Tap the widget and your map comes up. Ours will resolve to a little widget. When you want to go back to your speedometer display, tap the little widget and boom, ours comes up and Google Maps resolves to another little widget. <laughs> so as science has progressed, as technology has 